Please join me in welcoming Trevor Schultz. So today we are not only celebrating uh, springtime, uh, but we are honoring Eric Schockert, right? While I never had the privilege of meeting Professor Schockert, I learned about his exemplary uh, scholarship, his crossing of disciplinary safety zones, uh, engaging and passionate work as a teacher uh, here at Hampshire, his care for his family and friends and comrades, his work with rethinking Marxism, and uh, the influential roundtable on class that he convened in Youngstown, Ohio. Okay, so we have uh, some 45 minutes or so, so let's uh, get uh, right to it. Uh, digital labor touches uh, all of us, right? Whether you are browsing uh, OkCupid okay or uh, Tinder profiles in your spare time, search for Jersey Shore on Google, uh, order an Uber cab, or so, uh, run a survey uh, through Amazon Mechanical Turk for your next term paper, or uh, take an online course, uh, a MOOC maybe even, though I heard that they are not allowed here, so are not uh, credited, which I was pleased to hear, uh, or commit uh, to an unpaid virtual internship, you are performing digital labor. So I came to digital labor around 2007 to this topic when I realized uh, spending too much time on MySpace, if you heard of that or remember that, uh, and uh, I realized that what I was doing was actually generating value, right? So I was uh, working, generating value for Rupert Murdoch, I might say. So today in this uh, talk, I uh, will highlight what is and what could be successful about digital labor and what are some tendencies that I find worrisome. So once uh, we gain an understanding of this, we can examine how to work uh, around the concerning tendencies and promote the positive trends. So in the first few minutes, I will go through a few examples that I find troublesome. Um, so maybe let's start and, uh, by asking uh, for a show of hands, so like who has ever bought anything from Amazon? Okay, it's just so convenient, isn't it? It's incredibly convenient. Uh, but uh, let me uh, add that in the shadow of this convenience uh, linger the social costs for Amazon workers. So behind the screen, the sweatshop. Uh, let me uh, make these social costs uh, more tangible for you. So what you, hear is, what you see here just appeared in a German newspaper and I will uh, translate it for you. So this is uh, an inactivity report that is issued uh, to workers in the warehouses that basically ship your books to you, right? So every time they are inactive, uh, there is a record made of that and which is then presented to them after the second digression they are fired. Uh, so it reads, uh, colleague so-and-so was inactive from 7.27 a.m. to 7.36 a.m., nine minutes, Worker so-and-so and so-and-so -and -so were seen standing in between shelves 0506 and 507. Already on this date in 2014, this colleague was seen inactive from 8.15 to 8.17, two minutes. Also on this date, he was seen inactive from 7.13 to 7.14 for one minute. So uh, what you're seeing is this inactivity report and uh, in one example in Leipzig in Germany, one of these logistics workers in an Amazon fulfillment center, what they call these uh, warehouses, was uh, fired right five minutes after his second of one of those uh, digressions, right? So what you are seeing is a, a densification of labor, right? So to use the term that uh, labor scholar Ursula Hus uh, introduced. And uh, it's, it's possible because uh, you, you can actually track workers in this way because they are carrying scanners in these warehouses which uh, allow the, to monitor their activity and also there are supervisors who basically monitor workers at all times. So digital labor also means workplace surveillance. Uh, you, know, you can extend that all, all throughout society. You may add uh, just a few weeks ago that uh, the U US Supreme Court issued a ruling stating that workers in Amazon uh, warehouses have no right to be paid for the time that they are waiting for mandatory pat downs, so security screenings, when they are leaving the warehouse, right? This is also true, let's say, for uh, a psychologist who works in a prison, right? It takes like, whatever, 40 minutes to get into Rikers. You're not paid for that time. Uh, but uh, with Amazon um, 
uh, Mechanical Turk, uh, but uh, <coughs> sorry, Amazon also operates uh, in online uh, labor, brokerage, labor brokerage, so not just uh, these warehouses. Uh, and this uh, platform that is also run by Amazon is called Amazon Mechanical Turk. So here, workers log on to this website and pick tasks from a long list. Uh, uh, similar to traditional piecemeal work uh, in the garment industry, Mechanical Turk allows for a project to be broken down into thousands of bits, right, which are then assigned as individual tasks and uh, to so-called crowd workers. On Mechanical Turk, like on many crowdsourcing environments, inexperienced novice workers are making between two and three dollars an hour. So just like migrant workers, adjunct professors, baristas, or workers in the fast food industry, they work long hours, are underpaid and unprotected by labor laws, have few or no benefits, and are often treated poorly by their bosses. So Amazon claims that uh, Mechanical Turk has a labor pool of uh, some 500,000 workers. And uh, other crowdsourcing companies like Crowdflower point to an even larger invisible global workforce that for all practical purposes remains unidentified and which is compared to traditional workplaces at least uh, completely isolated. So companies like Topcoder even have clauses in their terms of use that prohibit workers from getting in touch with each other. So they are, I call them solo workers, right? The labor brokerage uh, Odesk Elance, so these two merged, if you heard of them before, may have a labor pool of some 8 million workers in total. So we're not talking about teens ordering uh, pizza uh, money, uh, trying to make pizza money over the weekend. It's a very large uh, group of people. Uh, on Mechanical Turk, uh, wage theft is uh, explicitly tolerated uh, by Amazon, which is, and wage theft is a daily occurrence. So some uh, crowdsourcers uh, reject accurately executed work to avoid payment. So rejecting it doesn't, however, stop these black hats or scammers uh, from still using the work. So Amazon's uh, conditions of use clearly state that crowdsourcers own the work immediately upon receipt, which means that they can do whatever they please with it. So the moment a worker clicks and submits the work online, it is owned by uh, this quasi-employer who uh, requested it. And uh, if no payment uh, ensues, there's no repercussion whatsoever. And in a further step, they don't even have to explain their rejection uh, of already performed work. So wage theft is a feature and not a bug. So I pulled this out here from the uh, terms of use, where you basically see that uh, the terms of ownership are immediately uh, transferred to the requester. So it's not uh, surprising that the turnaround among Turkish is around roughly 70% every six months. So it's a very large turnaround. You might now, of course, jump up and say uh, that, you know, that's not really possible. You know, and I actually had these experiences where people jumped up and said, like, well, that can't really be because there's a Federal Labor Standards Act, right? So like, how can these people make two to three dollars an hour? That's completely illegal. Uh, well. Uh, you should say, you know, people may say in a democratic society, you know, one wouldn't stand for exploitative work environments like that, right? Uh, but, uh, well, you know, for now, de facto, this is tolerated by what I would call a coalition of silence, uh, which is made up of the uh, legal community and, of course, policymakers. And uh, in 2011, the Department of Labor had uh, just uh, 1,000 inspectors responsible for 130, wait, for 130 million workers in 7 million enterprises. So uh, if you see this trend from uh, after World War II to today, so you see basically uh, how this number of inspectors uh, was uh, strategically underfunded, right? So the Department of Labor is uh, completely underfunded and could, even if they wanted to follow up on all these violations, it would take them 200 years to get to every workplace. So, uh, and if people are actually caught, if companies are actually caught uh, in, uh, for labor for violations of um, labor regulations uh, in terms of uh, wage or safety, the only thing they have to do is basically give, uh, pay the worker what they owe them. 
And uh, so this is the equivalent of basically robbing a bank with the only disincentive being that if you are caught, you have to give back the loot, right? So startups uh, cleverly sail around uh, the definition of employment by restructuring the work so that the people who are executing the task can be categorized as independent contractors instead of employees. So this is a really important to this whole discussion, this uh, uh, redefinition. So Amazon Mechanical Turk is small, this example I gave, but they claim that they have 500,000 workers. The actual number may, of active workers may be somewhere between 3,000 and 10,000. Uh, I say maybe because it's not uh, clear Amazon doesn't provide numbers and uh, in this whole entire industry, you, you, there is no clear sense of how large the workforce actually is. Uh, but there are studies that, um, you know, partial studies that uh, give, give us an idea. But uh, Amazon is a, is a very good example because it's basically an infectious model with thousands of other companies following that same business model, right? So it's by no means alone. So, but Amazon's reputation isn't solely built on uh, these micro wages, total workplace surveillance, or on the other hand, right, very low prices and uh, convenience. Uh, just think of Jeff, uh, last year, uh, Jeff Bezos struggling, the CEO of Amazon, struggling with this group of publishers, including Hachette. Uh, and in this context, um, Jeff Bezos said that Amazon should approach publishers the way a cheater would pursue a sickly gazelle. Um, so next, uh, Amazon, just I think two days ago, uh, introduced a new service. It's called Home Services, as part of which they want to be the online middleman when you are hiring an electrician or a plumber. So Amazon wants to dominate that field and then collect rent on your interactions, right? So, so far, based on Mechanical Turk and the labor practices we just saw in the warehouses, uh, there's really no evidence that would suggest that the company might understand uh, its relationship to digital laborers any differently, like a predator pursuing its vulnerable prey. So what follows is a map of digital labor divided into waged and unwaged work. Um, but today I will really only focus on like two very small parts, right? <clears throat> so just to give you an, I think it's very important to understand that this is sort of like breaching out uh, in very many areas. So let, let me first uh, tell you how I actually structured the talk while you peruse uh, this map. So first I will talk about platform capitalism, right? a term introduced by Sasha Lobo in Germany and by Martin Kenney in the US. Next, uh, I will explain uh, why we must address paid and unpaid uh, forms of work online alongside the labor connected to supply chains. So I will discuss the unprecedented scale of this real-time global labor pool, right? So the still you're seeing here is uh, from Alan Sekula's uh, film, Forgotten Spaces, which uh, tracks those supply chains that I discussed. In the third segment, I will go a bit more into detail about Mechanical Turk and the sharing economy. So I'm talking about the willful falsity of uh, Uber's and Airbnb's marketing campaigns, for example, the mantra of entrepreneurship and the Zugzwang uh, of precarity, and I will explain what that is in a second, trying to bust uh, the myth of choice and autonomy uh, that is in the water supply of platform capitalism infected by the anti-collectivist spirits of Ian Rand. Uh, so in his film, I don't know if you've seen this, uh, rather amazing film, uh, all watched over by Machines of Loving Grace by Adam Curtis. Uh, he really uh, deconstructs the influence of um, Ian Rand uh, and its connection to Silicon Valley investors and uh, startup hotshots where many uh, Silicon Valley, f uh, Silicon Valley uh, figures named their children after Ian Rand. Right? And for those of you who may not know Ian Rand so well, so basically explicitly uh, just for the individual fighting on its own against all others, doesn't need anyone, against uh, altruism explicitly, et cetera. So that sits, sits in the water supply of uh, Silicon Valley as well. So under the worn out genes of uh, the Uber executive, you might say the fountainhead. 
Uh, I will uh, end with quite practical ideas about platform cooper cooperatives. So please hold out with your questions until the end. So with uh, 30, 30 minutes remaining, let me think uh, with you about digital labor in context. So digital labor, I suggest, uh, imagine it uh, like the sharp, uh, shiny tip of a gigantic, uh, gargantuan, uh, neoliberal spear, right? <laughs> that is uh, made up of deregulation, right? Increasing inequality, the shift from employment to low wage temporary contracts, union busting, and the low wage crisis. So, along exploding financial uh, products and student loans, uh, digital labor companies like Uber, Crowdflower, and Mechanical Turk are among uh, America's most toxic experts, ex exports. Many researchers have focused on optimizing this little spaceship, right? These platform ecosystems, trying to make them run more efficiently with less social friction and a better understanding of the motivations of the workers. In contrast, uh, I suggest a conflict, worker organization, and the building of alternatives. So we can't leave society to the owners and developers, to Microsoft, Crowdflower, Google, and most definitely not to Amazon. So let's take uh, one step back. Since the 1970s, the productivity of American workers steadily increased while their real wages stagnated. More and more Americans went to college, but despite their skills, they, uh, their, their pay remains uh, low. The debt crisis and changed work regimes meant that a regular paycheck is increasingly unlikely to include legal protections, decent pay, or benefits. So the screenshot that you see uh, here basically shows you this uh, dichotomy of, on the one hand, rising corporate profits while the, uh, and, and effect, uh, more effective work by the uh, workers while um, basically their wages uh, stagnate. The next screenshot uh, that you will see is uh, from a work by uh, Natalie Bookshin, who is called, the project is called Long Story Short, and she interviewed 75 uh, very low-income Californian residents who describe what poverty, poverty actually means to them, uh, including not uh, being able to buy a toothbrush, right, a shampoo. So that's actually to have this sort of like tangible uh, hearing these accounts of what it actually, what, what these, this chart before actually means in the lives of these uh, residents of California. So the overall uh, burden of uh, changed regimes of work and the debt crisis meant that a regular paycheck is increasingly unlikely to uh, include legal protections, decent pay and benefits, as I said. Uh, today, 76% uh, of Americans have no savings, right? So this means that in the case of uh, an emergency, they don't have any financial fallback. 75% of unpaid interns in this country are women, and indeed, I don't think that's a victory for feminism. According to NYU professor Ross Perlin, uh, unpaid internships contribute $2 billion to corporate profits every year. Sometimes you might say the carrot is just a stick by other means, <laughs> to uh, quote the anarchist Bob Black. Uh, anything uh, that becomes digital can eventually get exploited. So developments like self-driving cars, app-based tax companies, and crowdsourcing systems can be beneficial, for sure, but are also introducing new vulnerabilities for workers. So digitization allows for new business models, novel chains of uh, value extractions and form of division of labor, most of which are abstracting its emancipatory and humanizing potential while undermining social security. So digital labor is a child of the low-wage crisis. Ever larger parts of the economy uh, are being re-engineered to move away from the employment relationship and closer to freelancing and independent contract work. So key to this new organization of work are online platforms like we saw Mechanical Turk. Uh, and they are all built on cloud computing, right? And we can talk about that uh, at the end. These platforms become digital labor bottlenecks to get a gig, you need to go through one of them. So growing numbers of workers do no longer pursue a career path, a job for life, 
while young people are increasingly asked to pay their dues by working for free as interns. Uh, whereas traditional employment uh, was like marriage, legal scholar Frank Pasquale writes, with both parties committed to some sort of long-term mutual project, the digitized workplace seeks a series of hookups. In this labor market of one-nighters, uh, people are working short-term or just casual hours. Uh, a closer look at templates of 21st century work uh, that are currently put in place reveals a trajectory of workers now taking on many gigs at once. Uh, for some, this is a choice, definitely, uh, but most are forced into this uh, atypical work by economic circumstance. So a few weeks ago, uh, probably just like many of you, I met my uh, tax accountant, and the guy in front of me handed in 15 1099 forms. Uh, some people uh, are talking about the switch to a 1099 economy, right? And demands for qualifications are getting ever higher, and anxiety, the fear of unemployment, and uh, poverty have become cent central life themes for many young people today. Uh, they are moving down the one-way street from unpaid internship to underpaid creative work. Such start uh, into work life then leads to a lifelong precarious career, which also makes life planning impossible and old age poverty a certainty. A 2010 study by the American software uh, company Intuit found that 80% of large American corporations are planning to substantially increase their use of flexible workers in coming years. It does get less depressing towards the end. Okay. <laughs> um, talking of depression. Uh, we are living in what the German South Korean author Byung Chul Han called a fatigue society. Right? So this is no longer a disciplinary society, Han writes. We are living in an achievement-oriented society that is allegedly free, determined by the call of yes, we can. And initially, this create a fe creates a feeling of freedom, but soon it is accompanied by anxiety, self-exploitation, and depression. Han writes that depression, exhaustion, attention, uh, deficits and burnout are not caused by negativity, but by an excess of positivity, which can bypass all immunological defenses. So too much positivity about 21st century work leads to anxiety, depression, and exhaustion. So we are already, 20, we are already 15 minutes into the talk, and I still haven't defined what I'm actually talking about. And uh, so just a few statements about digital labor. Uh, so 21st century, has become, uh, 21st century work has become more intensive, dense, right? As we saw with the uh, example I gave in the beginning, Amazon's inactivity reports. So time, time has become more central as an instrument uh, of oppression. Second, the definition of digital labor has to reflect an intricate understanding of both paid and unpaid forms generalizing one emerging trend, be that uncompensated emotional labor or Facebook labor, uh, as the sole tenor that has overtaken the entire economy fails to capture the uh, reality of many other modes of digital labor. It fails to account for the far crueler treatment of workers in the industrial sector that produces the hardware all along its supply chains. Uh, thinking about digital labor means contemplating global patterns of connection and accumulation that facilitate and promote such production. This means that all related processes need to be included in this definition. Everything from the assembly of iPhones, the Xbox, cables, wireless installation, Foxconn's factories in the Longhua Science and Technology Park in Shenzhen, China, that brings us Apple products, HP, Dell, and Sony and the mining of rare earth minerals in the Dem Democratic Republic of Congo, Nigeria, and China's Nanshan County, without which you couldn't boot up your laptops or mobile devices. The supposedly weightless economy would sink to the bottom of the ocean, wouldn't it be for all the workers at Foxconn's suicide mills? So suicide mills, you might remember that uh, 18 workers uh, committed suicide in those uh, factories right, that produce iPhones. 
A definition of uh, digital labor needs to divorce itself from the rhetoric of flexibility, choice, and autonomy. So remember Ryan Bingham's pitch uh, to the soon to be unemployed in Up in the Air? Have you seen Up in the Air? So uh, if you haven't seen it, uh, basically this is about a guy who flies around the country firing people for companies so they hire him to step in and say, you're fired. Children's admiration is important to you? Yeah. Yeah, it was. Well, I doubt they ever admired you, Bob. Hey, asshole, aren't you supposed to be consoling me? I'm not a shrink, Bob. I'm a wake-up call. You know why kids love athletes? I don't know, because they screw lingerie models. No, that's why we love athletes. Kids love athletes because they follow their dreams. Well, I can't dunk. No, but you can cook. What are you talking about? Your resume says that you minored in French culinary arts. And most students there were going to fry her at KFC, but you bust tables at Il Picador to support yourself. And then you get out of college, and you come and you work here. How much did they first pay you to give up on your dreams? 27 grand a year. And when were you going to stop and come back and do what makes you happy? question. I see guys who work at the same company for their entire lives, guys exactly like you. They clock in, they clock out, and they never have a moment of happiness. You have an opportunity here, Bob. This is a rebirth. Now, if not for you, do it for your children. So... Another one of uh, Ryan Bingham's favorite lines is, anybody who ever built an empire or changed the world sat where you are now, and it is because they sat there that they were able to do it. You have an opportunity here. So it's this ideology of forced entrepreneurship, right? The channeling of your inner micro-entrepreneur that I'm questioning. Uh, digital labor needs to be discussed at the fold of intensified forms of exploitation online and older economies of unpaid and invisible work Think, for example, of uh, Sylvia Federici's and Selma James and Mario Rosa Stella Costa's Wages for Housework campaign in the 80s, uh, cultural theorists on a Haraway discussing ways in which emerging communication technologies allowed for homework to be disseminated throughout society. Digital labor is also marked by an ever more pronounced power asymmetry between the class of owners, right? So the platform owners, what I call the digital economic surveillance complex, uh, crowdsourcing firms and services like Crowdflower and Amazon Mechanical Turk that hold all four aces and the abundantly available workers that hold none, as David Graeber would put it. The word labor has an image problem. Over and over, authors have uh, disavowed the term because it's just, it doesn't seem adequate anymore, right? If you think about your leisure bleeding in with your, uh, with your work, so it's all enmeshed, it's, it's the distinction is harder and harder, which led many scholars also to say basically the use of the word labor is just inadequate. Uh, and uh, in contrast, I would argue that giving up on the language of labor means losing the connection, uh, losing the connection to the history of labor, the fight for the eight hour workday, employer paid health insurance, sick leave and pensions. So historically thinking, there are the Haymarket riots, Lordstown, Ohio, Lawrence, Massachusetts, Texas strike 1912, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory protests, and uh, here the young labor feminist Karen Silkwood, who lost her life in the process of delivering secrets about health and safety violations at Ken McGee plutonium plant in 1974. You might remember the film Silkwood from uh, where Meryl Streep portrayed uh, this brave activist. So this isn't about some romantic attachment to the past. This isn't about the language of labor and living within it. It is actually about its cardinal lesson, right? Which is that in confrontation with the power of the employing class, individual solutions aren't working. So, and lastly, uh, for me, also non-labor is still alive and well, not at all. Uh, it is at, at all true that all life is financialized, as Mario Tronti and Paolo Verno and others have claimed. 
uh, there are still billions of people without internet connection, and that includes uh, people in America's inner cities. So halfway through this talk, uh, I have, so far I offered you some uh, very some examples of digital labor, a short overview, reflections on platform capitalism and the fatigue society, a few points towards a definition of digital labor. So now let me just have a a brief look at the invisible workforce at Amazon Mechanical Turk before I move on to the sharing economy. So Mechanical Turk is named after a chess playing automaton, um, this one, uh, that uh, was designed by the Hungarian nobleman Wolfgang von Kempelen in 1769. So a small body chess player who controlled the mechanical hands of the Turk operated this automaton. He was hidden in the wooden case, right? So the spectacle of the seemingly complex mechanized chess playing machine that you can see on the left, uh, complete with a turban wearing Turk, uh, puts small technical de details on display as distraction while keeping the actual human labor out of sight. The operator worker uh, remains hidden in the black box, quite literally. Uh, it was a mega hit in Europe at the time with dignitaries like Catherine the Great, Charles Babbage, and Edgar Allan Poe coming to experience it. So, uh, Mechanical Turk pays homage to the mentioned 18th century machine. So, where the historical Turk showed off technology to draw attention away from the human laborer, today, Mechanical Turks crowd sorcerers, as I might call them, and uh, crowd flowers and handies and odesk, etc., work with coolness, right, and the spectacle of innovation to conceal the worker. As uh, Hampshire alum Alex Rivera put it in his film Sleep Dealer, they are getting all the work without the worker. So again, I'm calling this uh, digital black box labor. In 2014, various articles appeared with headlines like how crowd workers became the ghosts in the digital machine, uh, on-demand workers, we are not robots, uh, Amazon's mechanical Turk workers want to be treated like humans, and uh, Amazon's mechanical Turk workers protest, I'm a human being, not an algorithm. So the angle of many of these articles is that employers, if they just would understand that they are dealing with human beings and not algorithms, they would pay them more fairly and treat them more respectfully. Artists and designers, oh, I went too far. Artists and designers uh, under, uh, understood black box labor already in 2008. Here you see a still from Andy Byers, The Faces of Mechanical Turk, where he tasked Turkish the workers for Mechanical Turk, to describe their motivations to work on Mechanical Turk. So also Jeff Krauss, uh, another artist, in a similar vein, recorded Crowded, a podcast where Turkers are talking about their hopes and dreams, so all in the effort to make them visible and uh, humanize them. Uh, Amazon described uh, Mechanical Turk as an artificial, artificial intelligence. And uh, one of the most striking illustrations of the different ways in which workers can be embraced is a software called Soylent, which is a word processor with a crowd in sight, as it was pointed out. So here, in short, uh, this MIT project, which uh, has stalled in its uh, beta state, is an add-in for Microsoft Word that embeds these workers in a work document. So for the characteristically low fee, they will proofread or shorten your text, just highlight text, and specify what you want to get done, and um, they will execute it. So the Microsoft, senior Microsoft research scholar, Mary Gray, uh, calls this crowds in, as code. Uh, it's, uh, you, there are other examples of that, the iPhone app, uh, uh, vizwiz.org that allows blind users to receive rapid fire answers to questions about their surroundings. So Mary Gray works about that. Uh, going beyond the examples of uh, Soylent or Mechanical Turk, expert and USD labor scholar Lily Irani analyzes the importance of black box labor, the hiding of very real workers when it comes to attracting venture capital. She writes that, uh, and I quote, 
by hiding the labor and rendering it manageable through computing code, human computation platforms have generated an industry of startups claiming to be the future of data. Hiding the labor is key to how these startups are valued by investors and thus key to the speculative but real winnings of entrepreneurs. Microwork companies attract more generous investment terms when investors perceive them as technology companies rather than labor companies. So the more unnoticeable and cheap this workforce promises to be, the higher the speculative fortunes uh, of companies will be. The digital infrastructure that Amazon has put in place, the code in tandem with its terms of use, choreographs, road, repetitive and potentially exploitative uh, interactions, I call that crowd fleecing. The term uh, digital uh, black box labor works well in this context to describe how these workers are disguised. Right? The metaphor makes sense here uh, in his uh, wonderful book, uh, Black Box Society by Frank Pasquale. If you haven't heard about it, you should definitely check it out. He reflects on the cultural meaning of the black box. Right? The black box can refer to a recording device like the data monitoring system in planes, trains, or cars, or it can mean a system whose workings are mysterious. Uh, we can observe its inputs and outputs, but we cannot tell how one becomes the other. So then in an online system like Mechanical Turk or Crowdflower, it is mysterious where the labor is coming from or who is requesting it and what they are intending to do with it. So the workers are tucked away. So the inner workings of these labor ecosystems and the number of active workers, as I mentioned earlier, are trade secrets. They are not revealed. The concealed workforce is not reflected in the business plans that only show direct employment. Thanks to this uh, concealed labor force, it is now possible to build a large company while keeping the number of salaried employees down. As subcontractors are offering employment, uh, I'm refer uh, are not offering employment, I'm referring to these consigners as uh, quasi-employers. Uh, referring to them as employers would be uh, inaccurate because they are not actually employing Turkers. Uh, the mentioned crowdsourced microtasks are paid between one cent and several dollars each. Tasks might include uh, the description of categorization of products, uh, the filling of in of service, the filtering out of uh, digs or other kind of body parts from social media, uh, stuff that violates the term of service, pornography the tagging and labeling of images and the transcription of audio and video recordings or receipts. About 18% of their workers on Mechanical Turk are treating it as a full-time job. So if this work would uh, be really exploitative, nobody would really do it. I heard a consultant and net critic Clay Shirky argue at one time. Uh, but for some workers, there simply is no other option than toiling on this crowdworking uh, platform. The necessity to take up low wage, a low-wage gig is like Zugzwang, which is actually an English word in the English dictionary, like uh, Blitzkrieg, so a German word, obviously, which means uh, playing chess. No matter the next move, the player will always be worse off than before. Uh, Here's what one worker said about uh, the, what free choice meant for them. He says, I don't know where you live, but around here McDonald's and Walmart are not hiring, and I have a degree in accounting and cannot find a real job, so to keep myself off the street, uh, I work 60 hours or more a week here on MTurk just to make 150 to $200. And that is far below minimum wage, but it makes a difference between making rent and living in a tent. So on the surface, it appears as if Turkers have the flexibility when it comes to the days and even hours of the day that they wish to work. Uh, at the same time, just like TaskRabbit, uh, they need to be glued to their computers all day long to catch higher paying tasks and respond to them immediately. On the other hand, however, uh, they could pass up such opportunities without losing the ability to continue to work on Mechanical Turk. So the global climate change of labor that we are witnessing right now is alarming, uh, but I would suggest that the future is really on fire. 
So it's up to you, right? So it's a blue pill, or well, you know, the red, uh, that can become uh, cognizant uh, of the matrix. You can just blend in and become a smooth operator in the platform economy, or you can consider collective alternative. And this is true for microtask work on Mechanical Turk, and it also applies to the so-called sharing economy. So I will uh, dedicate the remaining 10 minutes to my uh, th theoretical and practical proposal for what I call uh, platform cooperativism. Uh, it's a call to workers, designers, and developers. So there is a backlash against uh, un ethical labor practices in the collaborative sharing economy because of an utter lack of concern for their workers. Just for one moment, imagine the algorithmic heart of any of these citadels of anti-unionism uh, to be cloned and brought back to life under a different ownership model with fair working conditions and a humane alternative to the free market model. Take, for example, Uber's app. Uh, which includes uh, geolocation uh, and ride ordering capabilities. And the corporate owners and shareholders don't have to be the main benefactors of such uh, platform-based labor brokerages, right? Like dodge Uber and put a worker-owned cooperative or unionized labor pool in their place. So stop paying rent uh, to Uber. In New York City, uh, there are now more Uber taxis than yellow cabs, right? 15,000 uh, Uber cabs in New York City. So these apps-based worker-owned labor brokerages that allow workers to exchange their labor without the manipulation of the middleman are possible. Uh, they are possible for transportation, they are feasible for microwork, specifically Mechanical Turk and Crowdflower and other sectors. Entities like Uber, Ola, Taxi for Sure, and Lyft are vulnerable because their technology can be duplicated. So every Uber has its Unter, right? So every above has a below. And we have to go beyond this sort of friendly fascism of iPhone dominant design. Uh, taxi drivers and technologists can coalesce and build an open source app that equips and outperforms their corporate equivalent. It could offer workers dignity, financial stability, and higher social standards. So this, of course, is, and I'm highly aware of this, uh, so this is not kind of Polyanian, utopian um, rant, uh, but it's, uh, I think, it's a, you know, it's a challenge of a tall order, but developers in collaboration with uh, local worker-owned cooperatives can design such self-contained program for mobile phones, uh, cross-platform, of course, Android and iPhone. And they could add a badge, uh, basically an, a badge technology to advise consumers that a given platform operates based on ethical labor standards. So just like a fair trade uh, coffee, right? So despite its meteoric rise, so you know that uh, Uber received like all, almost $300 million in uh, venture funding and is evaluated at for $41 billion. Um, so there's this huge speculative uh, evaluation bubble as well as a massive international reach, right? So they're all over the world. Uh, there's nothing inevitable about Uber becoming the unchallenged winner in that market, at least on a local level. It's time intensive and by no means simple, but hey, you know, there's no magic when it comes to software development. Technology is only one part, arguably the smaller part uh, of this equation, and I'm not willing to give an inch to technical determinism here. Uh, platform cooperatives um, are also about apps, right? So yes, it is uh, mostly about worker organi workers organizing in cooperatives, but it is also about this technological side. Worker-owned cooperatives could design their own uh, apps-based platform, fostering truly peer-to-peer -peer ways of providing services and things and speak alternatives to new platform capitalists. Cooperatives uh, might uh, then be able to use the regulatory templates that uh, Uber and other of the, these other companies in the sharing economy already established, right? There are lawsuits now left and right, and in a way the, the successes or the regulatory solutions to that could then be used by uh, cooperatives as well. 
But obviously, there's nothing, uh, you know, there's nothing paradisical uh, about cooperatives, right? They are not the silver bullet for capitalism, uh, but uh, cooperative work and ways of living are something that we can do right now, right? Sure, millennials might stress their individual careers over an allegiance to any given co-op. Um, and here's me in a co-op I lived in. Um, so I know from, you know, problems. Uh, there are also uh, problems of competition, of course, that uh, cooperatives are facing in relation to global competitors uh, that are rolling in money. And uh, Silicon Valley's turbo capitalists are also zipping ahead while social movements and uh, regulators are rather sluggish. So for hackers, long tail workers, and labor activists, now is the time to step up their efforts before the network effect chisels these brands like Uber, Mechanical Toy, Crowdflower into stone. Because the network effect, which means that basically like Facebook is a classic example, right? We all hate it and most of us are still on it because uh, you know, everybody is on it. So once everybody is on Uber, you could say there's a similar issue at play. Uh, in, in, in play, at play. So we will not have three taxi apps on our phones, right? So startup hotshots suggest that there is a logical step from sharing of content through social media to the rental of goods, space, and the provision of transport through uh, de facto uh, companies like Feastly, Carpooling, Handy, uh, Cozaza, Eat With, Kitchen Surfing. So you know, like this uh, uh, example here allows you to sell the, um, the fruits from your own garden to your neighbors, for example. So the narrative of the sharing economy is incredibly smooth, right? Uh, the aesthetics, the design, the algorithms, you know, neighbor can sell their fruit from the trees in their gardens. You can rent an apartment in Rome, a boat or a tree house or a yurt in Redwood Forest. Uh, in Oakland or Berkeley, you can even uh, buy a home-cooked meal from your neighbor. Uh, and now you can also listen to your own Spotify account in an Uber taxi. So it's just all incredibly convenient, and you know, just who wouldn't want to embrace that? So consumers, raised with an appreciation of low prices above all else, welcome many of these market incumbents. And of course, all of these developments uh, play out against the background of uh, deliberate, deliberate shockwaves of austerity that followed the 2008 crash, right? The Reagan, Thatcher, the minor and flight controller strikes. And so the sharing economy is portrayed as the harbinger for the post-work society and path to ecologically sustainable capitalism. Google will conquer death itself, and this brave new disruptive economy uh, will rid us of Jurassic forms of labor, which might well include what uh, David Graeber refers to as bullshit jobs. Uh, but by now, only few people are still uh, fall for the solidarity theater of the disruptive sharing economy, right? It's deceptive peer rhetoric when referring to individual workers and consumers as well as its underhanded talk of changing the world, right? If you haven't watched HBO's Silicon Valley, you should try it. Occupations that cannot be offshored, the pet walkers and home cleaners are now subsumed under platform capitalism. Baby boomers are losing sectors of the economy like transportation, food, and various other f uh, services to millennials who fiercely rush to control demand, supply, and profit by adding a thick icing of business onto apps-based interactions. Companies like Uber and Airbnb are enjoying their Andy Warhol moment, their $15 billion of fame, uh, in the absence of any physical infrastructure of their own. Right? They didn't build that. Right? It's your labor, it's your car, it's your apartment, and most importantly, your time. And uh, they, it's the same like Facebook, right? which also basically runs on your sociality. So they are really logistics companies, right? where all participants pay up the middleman it's basically the financialization of the everyday 3.0. So there's no question that uh, legacy taxi companies have seen better days, right? Ride ordering apps are making transportation easier and also a bit more accountable as passengers can give dreadful drivers devastating reviews. So I'm not talking about the technology, whereas the technology is innovative and I would embrace it. It's just the problem is with the labor practices of the companies that fuel them. Uh, in the last five minutes, 
let me build, un, build out the importance of thinking about cooperatives, this thinking outside of the boss, right? So instead of counting down to the next month's apocalypse, instead of polishing the banister of the sinking Titanic, uh, let's make uh, the idea of apps-based drive, uh, uh, by apps-driven worker-owned cooperatives of design interventions and other forms of worker solidarity, you know, new forms of unions, for example. Let's make all of these ideas plausible. Cooperatives are facing copious amounts of challenges on the level of competition, like I mentioned, in terms of public awareness, allocation of work, wage levels, etc. But I'm asking, is real social change only thinkable if you have the kind of money that Uber has? Right? Is social change only thinkable if you have big money on your side? Being faithful to that logic would mean that there would never be a chance for gubernatorial incumbents like uh, New York's uh, Zephyr Teachout. And the inability to imagine a different life is capitalism's uh, ultimate, ultimate uh, triumph. Right? So the inability to imagine a different life is capital, capital's ultimate triumph. Teachout recently proposed that uh, one of the pathologies of the current system is that it trains people to be followers. And I would add that it conditions people to think of themselves as individual workers instead of collective owners. So why bother handing over the revenue to Uber, the middleman, Lyft and Uber have serious issues with attrition. The pay rates for drivers can and have been lowered from one moment to the next. Workplace surveillance in the form of reviews is constant, and drivers have been deactivated for things as little as uh, making a critical comment about the company on Twitter. And they call them, they are being deactivated, right? They're not fired. Um, there are already driver-owned uh, ride rental services. Uh, here you see one, it's uh, Lazus in uh, Israel. Uh, in Germany, there's a cooperative uh, type of eBay. It's called Fairmondo. It's a co-op-based version of eBay. Um, and Lazus, as I mentioned, is an Israeli peer-to-peer -peer taxi cooperative. In New York City, there's a coalition of 24 worker-owned cooperatives, almost exclusively operated by women. Over the past two, a few years, low-wage workers who joined these cooperatives saw their hourly wage increase from $10 to $25. In the United Kingdom, there are currently 200,000 people working in more than 400 worker cooperatives. And then there's the often cited example of Mondragon, which is a gigantic corporation and federation of worker cooperatives that was founded in 56 in the Basque region of Spain. And uh, in 2013, it employed 74,061 people. So we might also mention a party like uh, Podemos. In New York, uh, there's the TransUnion Car Service, a unionized apps-based driver company. So there are examples of, these, uh, idea, of this idea already. And in fact, uh, so I'm currently working with uh, various groups uh, on actually making this uh, happen also on a larger scale. I can talk about this uh, um, afterwards. So this is not just a talk, right? There's actually a project behind it as well. So let's do justice uh, to what we know about platform cooperativism. Uh, and we know how it can invigorate genu genuine sharing. It doesn't have to reject the market and it can serve as a remedy for the corrosive effects of capitalism and should not be mistaken for a Marxist fantasy. It can be a reminder that work can be dignified rather than diminishing for the human experience. So platform cooperatives are not a panacea for all the wrongs of capitalism but they could help to weave some ethical threads into the fabric of 21st century work. Thank you.